welcome to episode 25 of The Wheelhouse. I am Andrew O. And I remember that there was a time when I made a big deal about recording an episode, you know, late at night, like 11 p.m., midnight, that sort of thing, called the like after hours or something. Well, that's kind of dumb because uh, pretty much now the MO is to record really late because I procrastinate in preparing and this is my life now. So I have to deal with it. But you don't really care because it's just all normal to you anyway. Because all the episodes come out the same time. Anyway, uh, two, I guess, things I can talk about which aren't that big. I kind of have to rack my brain for things to talk about in this intro. I uh, played this really, really neat game called Her Story. It's a uh, sort of a narrative-based game that has sort of a uh, interface and sort of a uh, medium for gameplay that I've never really seen before. Uh, so when you start the game, you sort of see uh, a computer screen, like very old computer screen, and there's like this database. And what you do, the primary method of the gameplay is searching uh, keywords into this database and it pulls up videos. Um, and these videos are all uh, clips from a series of interviews with a murder suspect. Um, and it's, you know, her story about uh, what happened. And you had to try and figure out, well, is she innocent? Is she guilty? What really happened? Is she telling the truth? Is she lying? All that stuff. What's cool is that there's really no tutorial in a sense. There's there's like a very basic explanation of how to use the database. But it doesn't really tell you where to go. You have to figure that out yourself, which is probably the coolest aspect of the game. You know, you start watching uh, these videos and then she might mention, oh, uh, and then this person... You know, I met this person uh, on this day, and you're like, oh, I wonder if she talks about this person again, and you type that person's name into the search bar, and like, oh, there's three other clips where she talked about that. And then one of the clips, she goes, oh, well, you know, I met this person on this day, and on that same day, you know, I found a dead body or something. You're like, oh, well, I know that location's important, so I'm going to search that location. And what's really neat is that you're always... You always want to follow up on something. There's so many different leads and directions you can go. And what's really cool, which I, I can't imagine how, you know, making this game, they pull it off, is that no one's going to play in the exact same way. You know, people are going to search different things, end up, uh, you know, going th- down different paths, but making it so that uh, people sort of get to the key reveals and moments at the same time. Because I suppose you could write, uh, there are, there's are certain words that you could write, that would sort of reveal like everything, but unless you look it up, there's no way to get it unless you sort of naturally get to that point by searching, you know, more simple terms. Uh, really cool. Only takes like two hours to beat, but if you want to watch everything, you could. It, it might, you know, run you two and a half, three hours. But I highly recommended. Uh, something I don't highly recommend is buying a cheap twenty dollar VR headset for your smartphone. Because, uh, well, at least for me, I've been spoiled. Uh, if you know uh, from an earlier episode, I talked about how on the SMU campus, the HTC Vive had a demo station set up. I went, and it blew my mind because that thing is pretty amazing. Um, and I've been telling, you know, all my friends and family, hey, whenever you get the chance around you, you see, like, a VR demo station, go do it. If it's, like, an Oculus Rift, HTC, HTC Vive, anything like that, you got to do it. Because it's such a great experience. At, at, at this point, it is uh, not easy to get to. It's not easily accept- accessible because of, you know, the price barrier. These the things are like hundreds of dollars. Something like the Oculus Rift, you know, you pay hundreds of dollars for it, but you also have to have a really expensive, you know, PC rig to run it. Um, HTC Vive, you need to dedicate a whole room so you can walk around and do it. Uh, it's cost prohibitive. That was the word or the phrase I was trying to think of. Um, but, you know, I wanted to maybe uh, get a little sense of that VR again, maybe show my family. So I got this cheap uh, $20 plastic headset, you know, kind of in the spirit of Google Cardboard. Uh, you stick your smartphone in uh, and then there's lenses and there's, uh, you know, headset strap. Um, this one came with like a diopter adjuster so you could change the focal length on the lenses. Uh, yeah, it's not great, especially considered... Uh, in, in, um, in contrast to uh, the HTC Vive. Uh, not a lot of 
great support it seemed like there's a google cardboard app and then you just search in the instruction booklet for this model it said search vr in app store download vr game and that was that was all the explanation um there's no like vr app store you just kind of have to search around try and find some cool stuff uh resolution is not great um everything's always kind of blurry ne- can never get the focal length right Always my eyes, I don't know, it's, everything sort of always seemed a little bit off. I uh, felt a little bit of strain after a while. Um, yeah, I would say if you really want to, if you're very curious, you could get a Google Cardboard for maybe like the cheapest one, like a cardboard, cardboard one. And you could get it cheap, like maybe 10 bucks. Um, but I would say really get out of your way to try one of these, the the premium VR headsets. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, still a lot of debate whether they're going to take the world by storm or they're going to fizzle out like a fad. Uh, we'll see. Uh, like many things in life, only time will tell. One thing I will tell you now is how the show works. Every week, there's a recommendation of a piece of media, a book, a game, a movie, an album, anything like that. Uh, that week, I or my co-host, if they were to come back to life, would go experience that, come back, review it. And then the cycle starts all over again. That's what it's kind of called a wheelhouse, you know, like a wheel, like a circle, that sort of thing. Um, today I'm reviewing the very first book on the wheelhouse. This is recommended by my friend Edmund. It is The Sirens of Titan, the second novel by Kurt Vonnegut, released in 1959. It stars as uh, it stars Malachi Constant, the protagonist. He's the richest man in America. And he goes on a journey through the solar system. One can call it a romp through space and time. Uh, He's guided by Winston Niles Rumford, uh, who went to space earlier and through this thing called a chronosynclastic infundibulum. Uh, He sort of is, lives on this ethereal plane where he, you know, jumps around the solar system, uh, exists in all time kind of, and he sort of knows uh, everything that happens in the past, present, and future. And uh, thematically, everything that happens uh, sort of revolves around the search for humanity's meaning in the universe. And yes, overall, uh, this book is very good. Uh, at first, actually, the, the book's curt and circuitous style makes it difficult to engage with. Uh, but as the plot progresses... The book is unified by its philosophical themes, which I'll get into more uh, at the end. But first, yeah, first impression of this book, not so good. Uh, The writing felt uh, more amateurish compared to Slaughterhouse-Five, which I'd read uh, a couple months before. Paragraphs generally consist of one or two sentences, which I know is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's style, but here it was apparent to the point of distraction. This is, uh, you know, sort of exacerbated by the fact that Um, this book, especially at the beginning, felt like Wes Anderson films in a bad way. Love Wes Anderson films, love his style for the films, but it's sort of a little bit in excess here. And I'll explain, you know, it's kind of weird to compare a film style with, you know, book style, but if that was the first thing my mind went to, it just fits so well. Um, there's sort of this authorial voiceover throughout the novel that uh, frequently digresses from the plot. To give like these uh, explanatory pretexts. Um, for example, at one point in a conversation, Malachi says that he has the biggest art collection. Then that piece of dialogue ends, and then the narrator goes in- into explanation of how Malachi got that art collection. And it really is, you know, to the media plot, and I guess overall, thematically, it isn't of much importance. Um, for me, I would have rather that. Um, not happen, and just the person you're talking to just continue with their dialogue, you know? Um, and it's especially painful at the beginning because I really wanted the plot to get going, but it got sort of bogged down by these uh, sup- superfluous inclusions. Um, because, yeah, I felt like that yeah, there, there was, it felt like they had a lot of potential at the beginning. You know, some interesting characters and setup, very mysterious. Um, but it just took forever to get going because I felt like, yeah, it would be like in the media plot, oh, you know, uh, Malachi walked into the next room. And then it goes into a whole history about, you know, the room, 
an object he saw there. And I'm just like, Ugh, just get going. I want things to happen. In that same vein, you know, the, the narrator's voice is abrasive and sort of ham-fisted. Uh, again, especially at the beginning. Um, I had this quote here. It is worth stopping the narrative at this point. That's an actual line that happens in the book. You know, I talk, I talked about, you know, the example before of how, you know, it sort of broke broke the, the pace of the plot. This is as abrupt as it gets. It's actually just explicitly stating, hey, I'm going to stop things for a bit. Another example, and it, this feels so Wes Anderson. You could just imagine it in a movie. Imagine, like, a character, I don't know, like, you know, uh, Luke, Luke Wilson, you know, says, please be punctual. And then whoever is doing the voiceover, like Jason Schwartzman, he, he goes into the explanation, like, to be punctual means, you know, dot, 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 into explaining that. You know, you could just imagine that in the Wes Anderson film. But this happens all the time. Uh, okay, actually, that's not true. It's not all the time, especially in the beginning. Before Malachi leaves Earth, um, this is especially apparent. And really was not digging it. But these things uh, sort of trail off in a way, you know, after Malachi leaves Earth and starts going on his journey through the solar system. And it gets so much better. Uh, the novel has so much symbolic and thematic heft that the simplistic uh, sentence structure and syntax allows the reader to sort of uh, constantly, constantly absorb the philosophical uh, aspects. In other words, and I came up with this sentence myself, and I'm pretty proud of it, uh, The Sirens of Titan is easy to read, but hard to understand. Um, everything from characters, actions, motives, setting, dialogue, they contribute to the novel's themes. And these become uh, more prominent after he leaves Earth. And the things that I had problems with at the beginning, things sort of tie together. And, I, and I'm a little bit more easy on the beginning. Um... And when you really get down to it, it is an examination on the meaning of life. Um, very, very heavily rooted in existentialism, in classic existentialist fashion, uh, I felt, for me, again, this is a book where there are, you can interpret it many different ways because there are so many layers. Um, but for me, yeah, it's all about how life is absurd. Um, you know, having no inherent meaning. The universe, that is. Um, but it doesn't stop there. It goes a lot deeper than that. You had the character I mentioned before, Rumford, who appears to be the determining force throughout the novel, you know, because he is very prophetic and kind of knows what's going to happen, uh, you know, with his knowledge of the past and future. You know, there's a phrase, I don't have it down exactly, but something like, you know, everything that has been, will been, will be, sorry, that was weird, everything that will be, has been, saying how, like, you know, from his perspective, everything just is, and you can't really change it. Um, reminding me a lot of Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. Um, he's in that same sort of uh, conundrum. Um, also like Watchmen, uh, spoilers for Watchmen at the end, which uh, if you haven't read Watchmen, what are you doing? Go read it. Um, Ozymandias at the end, his sort of grand plan was uh, putting or teleporting this giant green monster into the middle middle of the city and it sort of unifies or unites all the humans of the world against it and similarly uh rumford he assembles an uh, an attack on earth from mars and again this unites uh everybody on earth for the single cause and consequently he creates this uh church of the god of the utterly indifferent this is his own manufactured religion um, and the main tenets are how everything's predetermined and there's no such thing as luck. So just from this one character alone, there is that existentialist theme, life is absurd, meaningless. Um, but it sort of revealed that there's a larger force controlling Rumford himself and all of humanity, the Trophilomodorians, um, which I think is the exact same name of the characters in Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, anyway, and... It sort of revealed at the end that all of humanity's purpose, according to the Truffle Medorians, was to transport a spaceship part to a stranded uh, member of the group named Salo. Um, yeah, it is pretty hilarious um, when, when you look at it holistically. 
Um, a lot of the what I what, what I really like about Sirens of Titan is that you know I do sort of in the immediate I'm like oh you know that phrasing was a little weird. I wish the pace would pick up here. But as things are building, you realize you know everything is sort of connected um, in the book. And when you look back at it as a whole, it is just one giant sort of comedic joke uh, in a good way. It is satire. It's supposed to be darkly funny. And yeah, there's a few, there's not many times where I read something that happens or there's a funny phrase and I laugh because of that in the book. It is sort of a more, uh, you, you got to take it as a whole and look at it um, from that perspective. Um but, you know, if you, you know, when it comes to uh, the Trophimadorians, you could extend that logic and say, well, couldn't there be a fourth rule in them? Um, well, yeah, that's possible. It sort of also revealed at the end that Salo, the stranded uh, guy, is his entire purpose is to transport a message across the universe. And he opens it when he's not supposed to. And it is a single dot, which in their language means greetings. And that is... The greatest practical joke of all time. Um, he kills himself afterwards, which, again, it's in the theme, so it is funny. Um, but it comes to sort of this conclusion. It, you know, it flat out says in the book, the purpose of human life is to love whoever is around to be loved. Um, and if you think about, if you read the very first chapter, it talks about how you know, people will need to turn in, into an inner perspective to find a meaning of life. That whenever people look outward for meaning or purpose, um, they come up empty. Now, in the beginning of the book, it says how an outward search, you know, has led to, you know, quote, empty heroics, low comedy, pointless death, which is scattered throughout the entire book. Um, but at the end, um, as Malachi is about to die, he's given this sort of vision um, of his friend, Stoney, and saying how, you know, there must be someone up there that likes you. And it is ostensibly a hopeful ending, but knowing Vonnegut and his wily ways of satire and whatnot, um, this is how I interpreted it. Well, yeah, when you come down to it, it's a vision, so it's not reality. Um... You know, I think Vonnegut still asserts that, yeah, in a, in in truth, the universe is meaningless. But there's nothing wrong with us not considering that in how we live our lives. If we just think, hey, I, this is who I am, and I'm going to, you know, live my life in a way that is loving for myself and others, and that will make me happy and make others happy. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I wrote a, you know, script called Pandora's Therapist, and it has very similar themes. You know, it stars uh, Pandora of, you know, from Greek mythology, and how she's half struggling with how um, she, everyone hates her for opening the box because all the evils out in the world, they all blame her. Um, but she's trying to find purpose and trying to move on from that and reconcile her problems with free will and fatalism, all that stuff. And the point I kind of reach at the end of that is don't concern yourself with all these grand notions of free will and if the gods control you and if everything's predetermined. You know, there's some sort of beautiful essence of things just being, you know. Um, and in a similar sense, that's how uh, at least I interpreted Signs of Titan. Um, it is sort of a hopeful note at the end, encased in an outer shell of nothingness and cynicism, but because we are living in the center, uh, we can make it. And, you know, as my script for Pandora's Therapist ends, why worry about, you know, the meaning of life, your place in the universe, and if you have free will, when you could just go out and eat some ice cream. So, that is my review of Signs of Titan, my first book. I haven't reviewed a book in full like that, so I don't know how that went. Uh, I tried to structure it in a way that, uh, you know, I've done for everything else. 
It's all different movies, uh, albums, games, but oh well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but now it is time to move on to our next segment, which we're doing this whole summer, and I think it's going really well. Um, and it's going to start right now. I'm here once again with Jacob Estrada for another edition of Who is Bruce Springsteen, which uh, I just realized we might... Uh, do you think we should change the name? Because after last week, that that question has been answered. Who's Bruce Springsteen? All right. I, I see that we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, okay. We're here after... In all some, seriousness, dude, yeah. it, um, it is your podcast, so you can name the segment whatever you want. Well, for, for the rest of the summer, we'll, we'll keep it the same. But we're, we're done talking about Bruce Springsteen for now. We've gotten over some... Uh, a few technical hiccups where we're here to talk about uh, this album called Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. Their 11th album uh, came out in 1977. Uh, yeah, let's right from right off the bat, Jacob. What did you think? Um, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit, actually. I won't say it's my favorite album, um, but uh, I did enjoy it quite a bit. And uh, I definitely think I enjoyed it more because of the advice you gave me about trying to um, focus on and uh, look into the instrumentals more. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, I really like their sound. Uh, I noticed uh, listening to it, there were, uh, all the songs were basically um, a combination of, or, or all the, the main instruments were always guitar, piano, and drums. Mm-hmm. And um, I think. I especially love uh, the piano parts in some of these songs. Oh yeah, Songbird, that <laughs> song. Uh, yeah, no, just, dude, that uh, song. That song is gorgeous. The, yeah, so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's just like, and it comes off songs that are like much more intense and hardcore. And you listen to it, and it's like it's so gentle, and it just like completely changes the mood of the album, and it's it's just beautiful to listen to. Mm-hmm. Any other general notes? Um, this uh, uh, this is definitely a very personal album. I some of these lyrics, um, th- some of these songs, like um, let's see, what's that one song? Uh, I believe it's uh, "Go Your Own Way." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, which is basically like, yeah, go, uh, or what it sounds like is go do whatever the fuck you want. You know, I don't care anymore. And then I did some research into the band and, you know, what was going on at the time. And it's like mo- a lot of these songs were written when the band was not getting along well yep. and when they were all like, you know, going through the divorce or relationship issues. And it's like, wow, these are <laughs> the, the, most of these songs are about dysfunction. Yeah. And yeah, all, all, almost all of them are. And because, you know, you have they're not all written by one person. You have three principal yeah. songwriters. And so you have a lot of different uh variations on that same uh, on a similar theme which i think is really cool but do you have uh, any other uh i know you like to talk about lyrics a lot <laughs> is there anything lyrically or is just generally about how you know it is so personal um yeah just generally about how it is so personal um and some of these lyrics are very upfront about it like uh secondhand news uh that one line one thing I think you should know I ain't going to miss you when you go. It's like, yeah. damn, but that's basically, that's basically fuck you. Yeah. It's, isn't that the, like the, the first line? Of yeah, the, the, yeah. It's like, I, I think it's the first line of the song. Yeah. The, and yeah. when you, th- when you think about it, that's a awesome way to start the whole album. It's the start of the album and it's kind yeah. of telling you what you're getting <laughs> yourself into. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I researched behind a little bit, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's Lindsay something? What's his last name? Buckingham. Yeah, Buckingham. Uh, it said this song was written, um, uh, one of the many songs in the album reflecting his breakup with Stevie Nicks. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, clearly it was not an easy breakup. Yes. Um, and uh, Dreams, you know, which like, it's such an, uh, and Dreams is such an optimistic title for a song. Mm-hmm. Okay, you think you hear dreams and like wow, it's like you know optimism and pursuing your dreams and all that, uh, and then you listen to it, and um, it's a song about loneliness and um, well, like there's a song that says that there's a lyric that says, but listen carefully to the sound of your own loneliness. Yeah, and it's just wow, holy shit! 
and then in, uh, another lyric, and what you lost, and what you had, and what you lost. And the yeah. song was apparently written by about John McVie separating from his wife, Christine McVie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you have uh, any favorite songs on here? I know you love Songbird. I love Songbird yeah. also. Ah, it might be Songbird, actually. Mm, not a bad choice. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Songbird. Cool. Yeah, Songbird's one of my favorites on this album, too. And as far as least favorite song, um, I don't know. Like, There's nothing inherently wrong with the song, but... Uh, I don't, I, it's, I, wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't say it's my least favorite, but I didn't really get it as, as much as I think I should have was Gold Dust Woman. Because apparently this is like one of Stevie Nicks's like best songs, mm-hmm. but um, I don't know. It just didn't uh, resonate me with me uh, uh, resonate with me as much as the other songs. Yeah, I, I had a similar sentiment. I think I mentioned last week how uh, the first half of this album I absolutely loved. Yeah, like I first listened to it a few times, and then the second half, it didn't really stick with me as much. Uh But going back, I like the songs a lot more in the second half. But I guess, did you feel the same way? Yeah, I felt the same way. I definitely liked uh, the first side of the album better than the second side. Yeah, which may maybe if you go back in you know a few months or a year and revisit the second side, you might like it more. Who knows? Uh, I'll definitely give it a chance. Yeah, well. You know, we've alluded to a lot of uh, things about the making of this album, and I could kind of uh, expound on that On uh, as we talk about Rumors, uh, 11th album, Fleetwood Mac, released February 4th, 1977. Uh, let's start with the band itself. So the band's lineup has changed many times uh, since its formation in 1967, and it's complicated, to say the least. Uh, the two main periods in the band's history, the original lineup uh, was led by Peter Green, who was present during the Fleetwood Mac's late 1960s success. Uh, other forming members of note, John McPhee on bass and the titular Mick Fleetwood on drums. Uh, eventually, Green left and other members came in and out. Uh, but the second period of success started in 1975 with uh, the band's 10th album called Fleetwood Mac. And uh, what's interesting is that their first album was also called Fleetwood Mac, but this second self-titled album sort of represented a new beginning and a fresh start, because now the band consisted of uh, John McPhee and Mick Fleetwood. They're still present from the beginning. You have Christine McPhee, a singer and piano player, who first appeared on Fleetwood uh, Mac's third album as Christine Perfect, but she joined the band full-time after uh, she married John McPhee. And then two additions of incredible note, uh, Lindsey Buckingham, guitarist and singer, and Stevie Nicks, uh, primarily a singer, uh, joined the band after Fleetwood, having uh, heard some of their music, asked them to join. Uh, also kind of interesting is that they're both American, whereas the McVees and Fleetwood are British. Um, so it is with this incarnation that Rumors is released, 1977, considered the greatest album, and it is one of the greatest selling albums of all time. Uh, it was created, like you alluded to, in the midst of a lot of interpersonal tension. Uh, the McVees got divorced, uh, Buckingham and Nicks were going through a breakup, and Fleetwood discovered his wife was having an affair. Uh, plus, lots of partying and drug use, uh, which is, you know, not very surprising and sort of expected. Um, In the world of musicians. Yes. Uh, but despite all that, the final product is fantastic. There's a wide range of songs, uh, due in part to the triumvirate of songwriters. You have Lindsay, Stevie, and Christine all contributing. Uh, also, the lyrical content is so emotionally charged, uh, which is a neat contrast because, you know, generally the songs are upbeat and poppy. Um, but pretty much all the songs are about other the other band members. Uh, the presentation of love and relationships, though, differs depending on the perspective of the songwriter. And at times it feels kind of, it feels so personal that it, it feels like you're not supposed to be listening. It's a little uncomfortable, like yeah, they're all singing actually. about each other to each other. Like, it's like you overheard a really uncomfortable, inappropriate conversation. Yeah, which I think adds to its uh, charm. Um, yeah. Also, for me, I love their guitar solos. They sort of enhance uh, whatever emotion, you know, that are already oh, dude, in the lyrics. Definitely. Yeah, in songs like Go Your Own Way, especially, or The Chain. Um, uh-huh. Um, wait, um, which is the one, actually, maybe it was Go Your Own Way, where um, uh, it's not a guitar solo, but the, gu- uh, the, the guitar just goes, uh, like, really crazy for a little while. Hold on. It's in the first half of the album. Where I had this in my notes somewhere. Oh, it was 
There we go. With Don't Stop. I really love yeah. the guitar and Don't Stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in general, all the guitar solos on this album are top notch. Um, and yeah, in addition for this whole album, very clean production, great vocal harmonies, great use of acoustic and electric guitars all around. It's pretty awesome. All right, uh, Jacob, any final thoughts on Rumors? I absolutely love the opening piano on Songbird. I want to yes. listen to that piano all day. Oh, when I first heard that song, I, I, I played that song and repeat so many times. It's so good. Uh, yeah. wait, who, who's, um, uh, who played the piano for that song? That's uh, Christine McVie. She wrote okay. that song, and it's just her and piano. Ah, oh, God. I could listen to her play piano forever. That was, that was just awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, don't listen to it too long, because you got to listen to this next album, which, spoilers, is a double album. So you got 19 songs to get through. Damn. Yeah, it is London Calling, the third album by the punk rock band The Clash. Released released, uh, December 14th, 1979, it's considered a post-punk album because it experimented and expanded on conventions of the punk rock genre, uh, musically incorporated hard rock, reggae, ska, R&B, pop, and jazz into a dynamic uh, punk foundation, and lyrically a diversified from the purely anti-establishment themes to include more complex social and political commentary. Uh, for these reasons, it is absolutely essential. I know Gus and Sterling, uh, rest in peace, they love this album. Um, again, it was a sort of an album that I listened to very early, and I didn't really get it at first. But I got to the point, having re-listened to it, that I think it's pretty phenomenal. But I'm really excited to go back and dig into it again, because I don't know it that well. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned... Uh, it's a double album, 19 songs. I think it clocks in at uh, a little over an hour. So not incredibly long as double albums go, but there's still a lot to get through. Uh, yeah. And just the like, sheer variety of the different songs is something that... Uh, it's something you want to listen to a lot, I think. But, yep, yeah, that's it. Thanks again, Jacob. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. It's kind of, we have, you, you kind of need it because if without you, I'll, I'll just be talking to myself, which I usually do for the show anyway. So, uh, you can, you can talk to the ghosts of Sterling and Gus. Oh, you know? I'd, I'd be taken to an insane asylum, but luckily yeah, no but one listens gotta, to the show. You got to so. cope with, with a loss somehow. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of understandable. I sometimes pretend I'm talking to people who aren't there sometimes. Uh, good to know, I guess. <laughs> Oh. All right. Thanks, cool. Jacob. <laughs> All right. Okay, man. Right. See you next week. Finally, got to play a recommendation. And I know what this recommendation is. And, um, yeah, I can't believe I'm doing this. Uh, here, you listen for yourselves. Hello. Hi. Who are you? I am Rachel O. Okay. What are you doing here? Oh, uh, you know, just chilling. But I also have a recommendation for you, Mister. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? What are you recommending? I am recommending Pokemon Go. Oh no. Why? My arch nemesis. Why? No, I just I've been not playing. Not like intentionally avoiding. Like oh, well yeah, I don't want to play it. Why not? Well, why don't you? Why don't you? Let me ask the questions here, okay? Why don't you first explain a little bit about Pokemon? What well, Pokemon Go to go with, and then I'll explain why. Um, yeah, I, I haven't been playing it so far. Okay, so Pokemon Go is a mobile game. <laughs> and uh, basically, you download it from the App Store, and you click on it. And then you start off with, like, a professor. It's just kind of like a regular Pokemon game where they're like, Hello, blah, 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 what's your name? Are you a boy or girl? Okay, and then... Yeah, you start out as a character, and you're just, like, in your neighborhood. It's like a little map. And you walk around, and you catch Pokemon. All right, and have you been playing this, like, since when it came out initially? Like, when um, it first came out? Like, you've been playing for, like, a while. I yes. Guess. So, it actually came out on my birthday. Oh, well, little that's fun easy to remember. Fact. July yes. 6th. July 6th. But at that time, I was on a cruise, and the Wi-Fi was really, really bad. So I was unable to download it until the next day. So I started playing uh, July 7th. Mm-hmm. And how did how did you find find out about this game? Um, I knew it was coming out, 
and my sister told me it was coming out sometime in July, and maybe the like the week of the cruise that we were on, and I was like really really excited, so I was prepared for that. So I was like getting ready for it, and then my sister texted me, saying that it was out, and she was like really excited. She put it in all caps, and yeah. Okay, so you've been playing this game pretty much since it's come out, and you love it so much. You're even playing it as we speak. Yes, I um, am. I'm trying what, to catch a goldine. What uh, what do you love so much about this game? Uh, okay, well, since as a kid, I've been a huge fan of Pokemon, like, yeah, since, f- as long as I can remember, I always had, like, a Pikachu toy by my side, I had, a uh, we had, like, a little mat and stuff, so I, d- I love Pokemon. Pikachu was my favorite, it's even a nickname in our family, um, and yeah, it's a fun game, because you, you go on your journey, you try to become the champion, oh, this is not working, I'll just try it out later. Um, so you're on a journey, you battle, you get badges, just the feeling of beating all those people who are said to be like really challenging and hard to compete against made it really exciting and fun. And this is like bringing that to life where I can actually go out, battle at gyms, capture Pokemon. Yeah. So, because you've been playing like Pokemon games all up to this point, whereas for me, I play Pokemon, I guess, elementary school maybe a little middle school but then mm-hmm. i kind of stopped playing for a while yep. so n- another pokemon game i'm not rushing out to go play it you know uh i'm not i don't have anything inherently against pokemon i know a lot, there's still games coming out a lot of people love it but there's also the aspect of this game like you're supposed to catch all 150 pokemon and i feel like i'm already late to the game so like why even bother trying to catch them all you know mm. but that's a, that's my own problem but i'll try it out and we'll see if i like it if i like it maybe i'll keep on playing if i don't and I'll stop, but we'll see. Okay. Okay, thank you for your recommendation. No problem, brother. Goodbye. But goodbye. So, I'm going to be playing Pokemon Go for this next week. Hopefully it won't take over my life. I suspect it's not. But I actually might do something a little special for that. I might do some in-field recordings. Um, going out, playing Pokemon Go. Getting some audio out there. Uh, if next week you don't hear any of that, it's probably because I was lazy, which I'm sorry. It's a tendency during the summer. Uh, but if you don't want to be lazy in the summer, one way you can prove that is if you go to Facebook, like our page there at facebook.com slash wheelhousecast, like us on Twitter at wheelhousecast, email us at wheelhousecast at gmail.com with anything you want. And I realize I said that out of order. I usually say the email last, so that I'm kind of uh, scared. My mind's going. I should get some sleep. After the email... Subscribe to our feed on iTunes where you can also rate and review us. Last time I checked, there's still one review. Don't know who did it, but it's excellent. Uh, if you think you can write one better than that, go ahead. Don't think you can. Think of it as a challenge and prove me wrong. Uh, after you do that, go to sleep because I'm going to go to sleep right now. <laughs>